of world news tonight. It's been a year. The war in Ukraine enters its second year as the UN votes to immediately end the war. Rising shortage. British supermarkets limit purchases of fresh vegetables and fruits as inflation continues to rise. Gaza bombarded. Israel keeps attacking Gaza strips as Hamas extremists increase assistance. And Bolivian extravaganza. Carnival dancers clad in colorful costumes dominate the streets of Peru Bolivia. is Adaderna World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and you are joining us on World News this Friday night. It's been a year since the Russian President Putin began his special operation in Ukraine, despite fierce assistance from both Kiev and the West. Now, the war in Ukraine entered its second year today with no end in sight. A UN non-binding vote demanding Russia withdraw its forces and global leaders set to bolster Ukraine and impose new sanctions on Moscow and countries supporting its war effort. In the vote, 141 countries voted for the resolution, 7 against and 32 abstaining, including countries with close economic and political ties with Russia, such as China, India, Pakistan and Sri Lanka. The seven countries who voted against it were Russia, Belarus, North Korea, Eritrea, Mali, Nicaragua and Syria. The UN motion in New York called for immediate peace and reaffirmed support for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity, rejecting any Russian claims to the parts of the country it occupies. In September, MPs in Moscow voted to illegally annex four regions of Ukraine. The UN also demanded that the Russian Federation immediately, completely and unconditionally withdraw all of its military forces from the territory of Ukraine within its internationally recognized borders and called for a cessation of hostilities. Before the sun was even up, Russian forces started attacking Ukraine from three sides. Explosions rang across the country, including the capital, Kyiv. Tens of thousands of civilians fled their homes, heading west. The offensive started hours after Russian President Vladimir Putin declared what he called a special military operation, saying the aim was to protect people from abuse and to, quote, denazify and demilitarize the regime. Moscow also targeted the southern city of Odessa and blockaded its port on the Black Sea to try to cut Ukraine off from crucial food supplies. Attacking from the south, Russia seized the Kherson region near the Crimean Peninsula, which it had illegally annexed in 2014. Moscow expected Kyiv to fall within days. Instead, it encountered stiff resistance from Ukrainian fighters as its own troops exposed their unpreparedness. After weeks of fighting, Russian forces pulled back, leaving a trail of atrocities in their wake. Footage of bodies strewn around the small town of Bucha on the outskirts of Kyiv shocked the world. Ukraine's foreign minister called the massacre, quote, the most outrageous atrocity in the 21st century. Then in April came a Russian missile strike on a train station in the eastern city of Kramatorsk, which killed over 50 civilians. This is President Putin ordered a fresh offensive to capture all of the Donbass region. The Azovstal steel plant in Mariupol, where a days-long siege took place, became a symbol of Ukrainian resistance. Over the summer, the tide started to change. Ukraine recaptured Snake Island near Odessa, easing the pressure on the southwestern front. In the weeks that followed, its forces launched a counteroffensive in the east with the help of Western supplied weapons and drones. They ended up recapturing several cities in Donetsk province. In September, pro-Russian officials staged referendums on whether to separate occupied territories in the Donbass from Ukraine. The votes were widely described as a sham, but Moscow declared the annexation of Luhansk, Donetsk, Kherson and Zaporizhia nonetheless. In a major blow to Moscow, an explosion destroyed a part of a bridge linking Crimea to Russia. Moscow retaliated with a fresh offensive targeting Ukraine's energy infrastructure, a strategy they continue to use, resulting in millions facing frequent blackouts as winter approached. Then, in a major victory for Ukraine, it recaptured her son and parts of the Mykolaiv region, forcing Russian forces to fall back to the eastern side of the Dnipro River. 
The coming of the new year saw little change in the position of the front line. But on New Year's Day, a Ukrainian missile hit a building in Donetsk where Russian troops were staying, killing hundreds, according to Ukraine, and embarrassing Moscow. Two weeks later, a stray Russian missile leveled an apartment block in Dnipro, killing over 40 people and leaving around 400 homeless. As the one-year anniversary of the start of the war approached, Ukraine readied itself for a fresh Russian offensive. Much of the fighting in 2023 has centered around the city of Bakhmut. With scores said to be dying every day, it has become the stage for the bloodiest battle in this war. Now, China has called for a ceasefire between Ukraine and Russia and a gradual de-escalation of the situation that will pave the way for peace talks as part of a 12-point proposal to end the conflict. The plan by China was released today by the foreign ministry and coincides with the first anniversary of the Russia's invasion of Ukraine, urges an end to Western sanctions against Russia, the establishment of humanitarian corridors for the evacuation of civilians and steps to ensure the export of grain after disruptions caused global food prices to spike last year. The proposal mainly elaborates on long-held Chinese positions, including that all countries' sovereignty, independence and territorial integrity be effectively granted. The plan also called for an end to the Cold War mentality, which is Beijing's standard term for what it regards as global dominance by the United States and its interference in the other countries' affairs. Beijing, which claims to be neutral in the conflict, has a no-limits relationship with Russia and has refused to criticize Moscow's invasion of Ukraine or even refer to it as such. It has also accused the West of provoking the conflict and the fanning the flames by providing Ukraine with arms. Beijing's top diplomat Wang Yi visited Moscow this week and pledged a deeper relationship between the countries, while Putin hailed a new frontiers in ties with Beijing and signaled that China's leader Xi Jinping would visit Russia. The ambassador of the European Union to China, George Toledo, mentioned at the briefing in Beijing today that China had released a position paper, not a peace proposal, and the EU will study it. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi urged global financial leaders to focus on the world's most vulnerable citizens as he inaugurated a G20 meeting on the first anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The Indian leader made no direct mention of the war in his address to G20 finance ministers and central bank governors on the outskirts of Bengaluru, although the conflict and its effect on the world are likely to dominate the two-day meeting. Modi said the COVID-19 pandemic and rising geopolitical tensions in different parts of the world had led to unsustainable sustainable debt levels in several countries, disruptions to global supply chains and threats to food and energy security. Participants at the meeting, however, are likely to focus on the war in Ukraine. The G20 bloc includes the wealthy G7 democracies as well as Russia, China, India, Brazil and Saudi Arabia. India, which holds the current G20 presidency, does not want the bloc to discuss additional sanctions on Russia and is also pressing to avoid using the word war in G20 communique language to describe the conflict. New Delhi has maintained a neutral stance on the conflict, vastly increasing its purchases of cheaper Russian oil. Russia calls its actions in Ukraine a special military operation. Now, major UK supermarkets have started rationing the sale of some staple food and they're struggling with the cost of living crisis, with social workers also quitting in record numbers. To get more on details of this, we have other there in a World News special correspondent, Sahan Sapatirana, joining us now from Leeds in the UK. Sahan, sir? Yes, I'm Raleigh. Several British supermarket chains have limited the amount of some fresh fruits and vegetables that customers can buy amid shortages blamed on bad weather in Spain and Tesco, the UK's largest grocery chain, said that it would temporarily limit customers to buying three items each of tomatoes, peppers and cucumbers. It follows similar moves by rival chains Aldi and Morrison's. The empty shelves have become a political issue, with opponents of Britain's decision to leave the European Union blaming Brexit for the fruit and vegetable shortages. But industry analysts say the main culprit was bad weather hurting crop yields in Spain and Morocco, two of the UK's main suppliers of fresh produce in the winter. The rationing is another knock for British shoppers already grappling with record price rises which have inflamed the worst cost of living crisis in decades. In the four weeks to January 22, the food price inflation hit 16.7%. That's its highest level since the data company started tracking the indicator in 2008. The British Retail Consortium, which represents all the big grocers, expects the supply disruption to last a few weeks. Back to you on Radhi. 
All right, thank you. That was other there in a world news special correspondent Sahan Sapatirana reporting from Leeds in the UK. An 11-year-old girl in Cambodia has died from the country's first known human case of bird flu in nine years. The Cambodian health minister warned that bird flu posed an especially high risk to children who might be having any contact with birds. Health workers in Cambodia disinfected a home in the country's south on Thursday after a girl who lived there died from so-called bird flu. It's the Southeast Asian nation's first known human infection of the H5N1 avian influenza since 2014, according to its Minister of Health in a statement. It said the 11-year-old from Preveng province was diagnosed with bird flu after falling sick with a high fever and cough on February 16, and that her condition worsened before she died on Wednesday. On Friday, authorities announced the girl's father had tested positive for H5N1 but was showing no symptoms. They were also testing others who had been in contact with the girl and warning Cambodians not to handle dead or sick animals and birds. Avian flu has ravaged farms around the world over the past year or so. It's led to the deaths of more than 200 million birds from either the disease or mass culls. The World Organization for Animal Health, a spillover to mammals, has sparked more concern among experts recently, with hundreds of sea lions killed by bird flu across Peru since mid-January. The World Health Organization earlier this month noted the spread of H5N1 influenza to mammals, but said the risk to humans remained low. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Now over in Washington, D.C., the Pentagon said South Korea and the U.S. held a tabletop exercise to prepare for a potential nuclear strike by North Korea. South Korea and the United States practiced coordinating their response to possible nuclear attacks by North Korea for the first time in six years. The Pentagon said the two sides conducted the Deterrent Strategy Committee's tabletop exercise, or TTX, on Wednesday. The senior-level discussion-based drill was aimed at sharpening the Allies' coordination and joint planning to strategize and execute nuclear deterrence. The drill came at a critical time for the Allies, following North Korea's firing of an ICBM last Saturday. They also held naval missile defense drills with Japan in the EC earlier on Wednesday, simulating ballistic missile detection and interception. More joint exercises are coming up after Seoul and Washington last year agreed to resume the large-scale combined training that they scaled down during the previous Moon administration in hopes of engaging the North. However, Pyongyang has always used the drills as a pretext for further aggression. Experts believe the North will continue its nuclear and missile testing, leveraging the growing geopolitical divide between the West and autocratic governments. South Korea's military intelligence said Wednesday that the North has improved its ICBM capabilities and is believed to be planning a seventh nuclear test to miniaturize warheads. Now, the escalating conflict between Israel and Palestine continues with airstrikes after a deadly Israeli raid in the West Bank earlier this week. The skies of Gaza lit up with Palestinian rocket fire and Israeli airstrikes today. Just hours after Israeli troops stormed into the city of Nablus in the occupied West Bank on Wednesday. The raid, conducted in broad daylight, meeting resistance from an angry crowd of Palestinians hurling rocks and firebombs. The Israeli military says it was disrupting an imminent attack by terrorists from a group known as the Lion's Den, surrounding them in a house, and when they refused to surrender, destroying it with a rocket. 11 Palestinians killed in the raid and hundreds more injured, according to the Palestinian Health Ministry. Several of the dead were militants, but others were civilians, the ministry says. This, the moment a Palestinian nurse realizes his own elderly father is among the dead. And Israel's military say they are investigating this video. People familiar with the location and timing of the incident, which appears to show a Palestinian man shot in the back as he runs away. The Palestinian Authority calling the raid a massacre and the State Department voicing concern. Violence in the West Bank now at its worst in 20 years, according to the Palestinian Health Ministry. And this morning in Gaza, Palestinian groups firing rockets into Israel. Most were intercepted. Israel's Air Force striking back against what it says were Hamas militant compounds.
Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu showing no signs of backing down in the face of questions and criticism over the deadly raid. <laughs> Hours after the airstrikes, Netanyahu giving new administrative powers over the West Bank to one of the most far-right members of his coalition government and openly defying the Biden administration. This month approving Jewish settlements in the West Bank previously considered illegal even under Israel's own laws. Today, meeting with a delegation of Republican U.S. senators showing their support for Israel, led by minority leader Mitch McConnell. Expected to also meet Democrats, led by Chuck Schumer, who are also in Israel. It all comes as Netanyahu faces ongoing mass protests over his plans to weaken Israel's judiciary. He says it's a badly needed reform to curb activist judges. But critics warn the move could fatally undermine Israeli democracy. Palestinian Authority hemorrhaging credibility with its own people and losing security control in parts of the West Bank. Now, with Palestinian anger rising, gunmen on the streets, and Israel holding its hard line, fears the worst may yet be to come. Alibaba Group Holdings Limited reported better than expected quarterly revenue helped by its efforts to cut costs and China's easing of COVID-19 curbs. The e-commerce giant has weathered a weak economy in China which only lifted its three-year zero-COVID policy in December. Alibaba is feeling the benefits after China lifted health crisis lockdowns. The e-commerce titan beat forecasts in the third quarter. Net income surged 69%. Revenue rose 2% to almost $36 billion, even as overall retail sales in the country dropped. Consumer spending in China is now expected to stay weak for the first part of the year. However, analysts bet that people will gradually start to unleash savings built up during lockdowns. Alibaba also hopes to get relief from a regulatory crackdown. It's been in the spotlight since late 2020, when founder Jack Ma irked Beijing with a speech critical of watchdogs. Authorities subsequently cracked down on the country's whole tech sector. But Beijing is now keen to help revive stalling economic growth, and has signalled it will ease up on some of the measures. Now artificial intelligence is a new hope amid global excitement over ChatGPT, the AI chatbot backed by Microsoft. Alibaba is currently testing its own rival product, though it faces competition from a bevy of local rivals, including Baidu and JD.com. Alibaba's US traded shares jumped over 6% in pre-market trade following the results. Welcome back, and for more news that take you around the world in a minute. Residents in the coastal regions of Brazil, Sao Paulo State are still reeling from a heavy rainstorm which has left at least 50 dead and forced upwards of 3,500 others out of their homes since February 19, according to local authorities. Chinese President Xi Jinping and his wife Heng Lian met with Cambodian King Norodom Xiaomi and Queen Mother Norodom Xianluk at the state guest house in Beijing, with both sides vowing to carry forward the deep traditional friendship between China and Cambodia. A monster U.S. winter storm pounded the northern plains and upper Midwest, killing a firefighter, knocking out power to more than 900,000 people and cancelling or delaying thousands of flights. A storage facility belonging to Mexico's state oil company Chemex exploded in eastern Mexico. The firm said a statement five workers are missing and three are hospitalized following the fire at a storage facility in the town of Veracruz. A brown bear that lay almost perfectly preserved in the frozen wilds of eastern Siberia for 3,500 years has undergone a necropsy by a team of scientists after it was discovered by reindeer herders on a desolate island in the Arctic. Because it was found just east of the Bolshoi Etherkian River, it was named the Etherkian brown bear. And that is all from us here on World News Tonight. Join us again on Monday as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can always rewatch the entire program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, we leave you tonight with the color-flooded streets of Bolivia as carnival celebrations with dancers clad in vibrant costumes dominated the city of Oruro. Thank you for watching. Have a great night. <laughs>